one final speaker. We have 30 minutes to go, and then y'all will be on your way. So I'm very, very pleased um, to introduce you guys to the only physician that we have on our panel today. Dr. Mazzoni is um, a movement disorders neurologist in um, the Movement Disorders Group at Washington University, so right here in St. Louis. He is a member of the Movement and Neurodegeneration Research Center directed by Dr. Gammon Earhart in the program of physical therapy. His research, research focuses on how neurological disorders affect our ability to control movement. He is interested in physical and technological interventions that can reduce the impact of motor symptoms on daily activities. In his clinical activities, Dr. Mazzoni evaluates and treats adult patients with movement disorders of all types, including Parkinson's disease. So, welcome, Dr. Mazzoni. Is this right? Oh. Uh, good afternoon. Um, thank you, uh, Tricia, for inviting me. Thank you for the PDA. For, um, organizing something that seems so obviously useful. I see a number of my patients here, thank you for coming. Um, and then uh, this worked, yes, it worked again, good. It did work an hour ago or so. Um, so freezing on gait is a difficult problem. Uh, this is a research update. Um, you uh, will be disappointed or you should be disappointed because I don't have uh, something very useful to tell you. Um, it's, it's a problem where the research is really trying to figure out what we can do. Um, unlike other areas of physical activity and exercise, where you've heard clear recommendations uh, for freezing, um, I have one recommendation at the end based on some of the insights that we have. Um, so instead I'll show you, I'll give an update on various aspects of, how, of what this phenomenon is and what kind of research we're doing, what we're hoping for the future. Um, in possible approaches to relieve this problem. But just at the outset, I want to say that with apologies that uh, it's a problem that we all found very difficult. This is a disclosure slide, which I think is supposed to show sources of research, research support, uh, consulting relationships, stock equity, and off-label devices. I think this applies if I mention a device. Is that officially FDA approved and known? Uh, all of this is research-based. This is uh, where I divide my time in the clinical world and in research. Uh, Joe Permother is the director of movement, the Movement Disorders Division. Uh, some of you come to that building. Um, in the, that's where I uh, uh, see patients in clinic. Um, and the building, uh, the other building is the, uh, where the program in physical therapy is. Gabon Earhart, uh, who's here, um, directs a research program in movement science. And, uh, and she allows me to do research in, the, in her lab. Um, but I'm showing these two people not only because they're colleagues I respect, but um, because we're freezing on gait, as, as in several other problems in Parkinson's, we're getting a lot of benefit from collaboration across disciplines. Um, some insight from motor control, from physical therapy, from uh, brain imaging uh, is helping us understand this problem more. Um, and at WashU, collaborative research is very highly encouraged and supported. I'd be very happy about that. So freezing on gait uh, can be described as sudden interruptions in the gait cycle. It can happen uh, during walking, uh, in the middle of walking, or at the start of walking. So I'm going to play this video. I'm going to cross my fingers first so that it has a higher chance of playing. And you'll see, aha. Uh -huh. OK, the uh, one doesn't work. OK. Uh, these are the different type of video from the ones that of this type. So if this one plays, then we can skip those. This is one we tested. Okay. So this is uh, this will be fine. We can skip the other two videos. Um, uh, the previous videos were in the clinic. These are in the in the, one of the labs using a device that an engineer uh, that I collaborated with uh, at Columbia University uh, created. And so I'm going to pause it. And so that segment was to show that freezing is a motor block. Some people in this room have experienced freezing, so you know exactly what it is. Those of you who haven't saw that the feet just st stopped walking, and it looked as if they were glued or stuck to the ground. Um, it's a very frustrating 
uh, thing because it, it's as if your feet do it out of your control. Your brain tells your feet to do it out of your control. And so you saw a few seconds of not being able to walk all of a sudden. Now here I'll show you that freezing occurs as sudden events or episodes in the middle of normal walking. So uh, the steps you saw before looked abnormal. Uh, the difference from other abnormal steps in Parkinson's is that the person uh, can walk much better most of the time. And that's what's, what you'll see here. The volume is not necessary, so I'll, uh, the sound can go down. We don't need sound. So you see how um, the person was walking uh, with pretty regular steps without difficulty until he came to a turn. Thank you. And then at this point, the feet stop so much and for so long that he stops trying. And now all of a sudden he can walk again. Okay, so it's different from short stride or fascination uh, caused by Parkinson's all the time. It's, uh, it's something that occurs in episodes. And then it's highly variable. It's unpredictable when it occurs. It could happen uh, during turning or at other times. It can also be severe and prolonged or brief. So you'll see some examples here of brief. This is a different patient. And when she turns, that was a pretty normal turn. And there you go. Hesitation for about a second or so. And then she walks again. And when she turns again, right there, maybe half a second of freezing. And not only that, on some turns, she doesn't have freezing. And so this is just to show you the insidious, almost nasty nature of freezing. It, it can happen when you, um, it can look like it happens when you expect it, like when turning, but sometimes it doesn't happen. And then, um, and then it can be very brief um, or very severe. And then you might think that this uh, young woman with Parkinson's has brief freezing, and so she doesn't have as much trouble or danger of falling as uh, the first person with Parkinson's. But I wrote here that brief freezing can be as dangerous as prolonged freezing, because even though most of the episodes you, that you saw just now were very short, Here's another instance where nothing was different. You know, there wasn't any pressure or change in the, in the hallway. And then she almost fell. Uh, we had to actually hold on to her. So I'll tell you briefly the story of the two of these patients. One is the one whose videos you didn't see. Um, but he had similar uh, freezing to uh, this lady here. Uh, he came to the office on a low dose of carbidopa levodopa in a wheelchair with uh, very severe Parkinson's symptoms. Uh, we raised the dose of levodopa and all his symptoms except one, except two, went away. Um, he was able to walk with a, with a wheelchair, walk quickly, uh, turn, and uh, what he had left was freezing and uh, poor balance. And so he would freeze and his poor balance would lead him to fall and he had to go back in the wheelchair only because of freezing, uh, freezing of gait. Um, uh, the young woman was 15 when she developed Parkinson's, and, uh, and again, she uh, at one point progressed to the point that she had uh, symptoms across the spectrum, rigidity, tremor, and so on. And we also raised the dose of medications when she had um, the disease for about eight years, and she went back to walking, and. Um, Many of you know the score we use, the scoring system, UPDRS, a scale for summarizing, adding up all the symptoms. And on three visits um, at a high dose of uh, medicine, her UPDRS score was zero, except for freezing. Uh, the UPDRS doesn't capture freezing. And so she actually had no recordable Parkinson's. At this point, it was about 12 years into the course of her disease. So her response to medication was so powerful that she could be symptom free on medication, except for freezing. And yet, um, because of freezing, she almost got hit by a car because uh, she tried to cross the street and the cars were approaching New York City. Cars don't slow down as much as here. Um, the, um, she got paralyzed in the middle of the street and, um, and basically became more and more impaired uh, only because of freezing on gate. Uh, so, all of that is to say it's a serious problem. Now, 
that makes it a challenge for the people who have it, uh, for patients who are uh, freezing out gate. It actually is a challenge for researchers. Uh, the features of freezing make it difficult to study as well. So the unpredictability makes it difficult to study in the lab. So the young woman who had freezing, I used to evaluate her freezing uh, when I called her in the waiting room and when I said goodbye and I walked with her to the elevator because the rest of the time she never had freezing. I could not make it happen. And when you saw it here in the lab, I figured out one trick to make it happen, which was to tell her at the last minute whether she'd turn right or left. But otherwise, we got her in the lab, tried to study her, and uh, we couldn't do it. And uh, a study by Dr. Erhard's group actually uh, tried to um, use different um, ways to elicit freezing because it's a problem in research. Uh, one is, uh, you see the four conditions in the slide, natural walking, walking fast, fast pace, walking in small steps, and walking in small, fast steps. And I tried this in the office as well. I say they're walking very fast, short steps to try to visit freezing. And in the studies, nobody got freezing from these maneuvers. Um, so that's a frustration with research. Uh, the effect of pressure um, is a challenge for research as well. So um, one situation that I call pressure mm -hmm. is um, trying to get into the elevator. There's time pressure. And, uh, and another situation is if someone uh, turns, uh, you know, walks around the corner and appears suddenly walking towards you. These are situations that cause freezing. In the case of the young woman, she lived in an apartment building and the toughest moment of the morning was getting out from the elevator through the lobby of her apartment building to the door because the doorman would hold the door for her. And that made her freezing maximal. And she would just be paralyzed in the middle of the hallway with the poor doorman trying to be helpful. Um, so how, you know, how do you overcome this? Well, one way is to actually use that for research. And in this study, um, virtual reality was used where uh, patients wore goggles that would create one of two scenes. One is on the left, and they had to walk in the gray plank with the ground, flat ground uh, uh, around them. And in the other, the scene was uh, artificially created to look like there was a drop, uh, like a plank with an abyss around it. And uh, in that environment, uh, the same person had much more freezing uh, episodes, many more episodes of freezing than normal. So that's one way that we try to study freezing better. Uh, another challenge for research is that balance is impaired um, in people who freeze. So it causes falls. So how do we study it safely? And, uh, and a study where the first author is also here, still in the room, Ryan? Oh, maybe he had to leave. Anyway, Ryan Duncan. Um, uh, showed that uh, not only does Parkinson's affect balance, but people who have Parkinson's and freezing of gait had worse balance problems than people who have Parkinson's without freezing of gait. And then the biggest challenge is the treatment resistance. Okay, uh, freezing of gait often resists treatment. Medications sometimes work, but even if they do, you may hit a limit. And in the young woman that you saw earlier, the limit was the painful dyskinesias. There was a dose where the freezing also disappeared, but then she got painful, you know, abnormal postures and, and the movements of the shoulders and arms. And so she always adjusted her own medicine to find the balance between pain and risk of falling. And then there are strategies. Uh, some people, many of us call them tricks. Uh, strategies, sometimes uh, those strategies use cues, uh, like uh, uh, laser cane, um, trying to march, thinking about marching, using a metronome, and so on. Those can be uh, highly individual specific. Uh, there are no clear principles that tell us how to design one cue or strategy that may work for many people. And also many of them uh, decay, they stop working uh, after a while. And so those are challenges about freezing a gate. Um, a couple of words about mechanisms. Why does it happen at all? We don't know, but it's not as simple as it might look. It's not really just the feet having a problem. Um, it's really a problem with how the brain controls gait, we think, but maybe not even gait, how to get from here to there. And the reason I say that is, uh, first of all, I'll show you the hypothesis. There are five hypotheses in a great review paper from a few years ago. And I'm not going to read them. Well, the reason I'm showing you five hypotheses is that you should be suspicious that we don't know yet if you see five possible hypotheses. Um, I think, I mean, these are all good summaries of evidence. These are features of, you know, there are all problems with pattern generation, you know, generating a cycle of the feed and so on. But these hopefully will be 
summarized with new insights into more uh, of a single principle of what the control problem is. And that's where engineers can help us because they design algorithms to control machines all the time. There's something about the control of gate that uh, may obey similar principles to the ones that we understand for machines. Um, some studies looked at brain imaging. Is there a place that has abnormal activation for imaging? Uh, in this study, uh, here I will show um, <coughs> brain imaging we use to study freezing of gait. You might wonder, those uh, imaging machines are big and heavy. Um, how do you put them on people so they can walk? No, that's a joke. Um, you, you, you can. So, so people figure out actually ask people to imagine walking. And um, the thing that surprised many of us was that, number one, if you imagine walking, you, you can activate brain regions that you also activate when you walk. Um, but also, that if you have freezing on gate and you imagine walking, you can have the experience of freezing. Um, and so, um, uh, and so imaging actually can be used, and um, the finding was that there are several areas that are abnormally active during freezing of gait. So it's not as simple as one spot of the brain that we could go and, and try and fix. Uh, other studies show impaired coordination. Uh, here's an example of poor coordination of left and right stepping when you walk. So if you look at the bottom left, this is someone without Parkinson's walking straight, and the flat line means that the feet are walking in perfect out of phase from each other. So, you know, one, two, one, two, one, two. And then if you go to the right, you see that when you do things like backward walking and, and turning, it changes a little bit. Uh, but up here and to the right, it changes much more. So the scatter of these points is an indication that coordination is much more impaired when you turn if you have freezing of gait than if you turn um, and you don't have freezing of gait. But uh, two other findings that are very interesting is that it's not freezing of the feet only. So there may be a more general problem in motor control. Uh, in a study, also here I will show you um, the, uh, the, uh, the study focused on eye movements and how easily can we start an eye movement. And people with freezing of gait had more uh, of a delay uh, starting uh, certain types of eye movements. So you, you see here, the pro saccade is a regular saccade, meaning if, if I shine a light, you look there, and all three groups here are on one line, meaning that everybody takes the same time to make an eye movement. Here is when I tell you, when I, when I look left, you look right, or when I shine a light on the left, you look right, or when I say A, go right, and when I say B, go left. So it's a more complicated type of uh, looking. And people with freezing are on this uh, gray line here, which is delayed from the other people. And so there's trouble not only starting walking or m continuing to walk, but also starting eye movements. And then um, one more example that shows that uh, freezing is not specific to the legs or feet. Um, there was a report uh, from the Moon Disorder Group here at Was uh, Washington University where a patient used to have freezing, regular freezing when walking, uh, then started using a wheelchair and uh, developed freezing in the hand and arm used to steer and propel uh, the chair. In similar circumstances, that used to lead to freezing of gait, like uh, entering and leaving an elevator. So these are hints that there's a problem at the higher level of control that the brain uses to control a variety of movements. Okay, so to, for treatment, um, medications can help off freezing, meaning freezing that happens when, uh, when you have other symptoms of Parkinson's and you're not having the benefit of medicines. And then a the number of people have on freezing, meaning even when the medication is working, freezing is there. So the freezing may be resistant to medications or the required dose may be too high. Okay, I'm gonna skip over uh, this one, uh, so as far as physical intervention, which is the theme today, um, there was a study that you heard about already where uh, tango uh, as a form of dance helped relieve a number of symptoms of Parkinson's and uh, freezing on gait was one of them. Um, here you see the summary for the UPDRS score, so the sum total of all the symptoms of Parkinson's which stayed high for people who didn't do the dance and decreased 
uh, for people who did the dance, uh, showing an improvement. And we did all those measures, freezing on gate uh, was also one of the things that improved. So um, one area of uh, active research, uh, or at least active interest um, for future research is queuing. Uh, freezing on gate can be aborted. Now you may, uh, this may not play. Oh, this one plays, yes. So this, uh, this man, uh, freezing on gate that you see right here, he tries to turn and his foot is stuck. And my uh, mentor is uh, trying to put an obstacle in front of his foot, like uh, his own foot, because sometimes you ask, you give visual cues as a cue to abort freezing. And then he told us that his wife had figured out a trick. She, I don't, I don't know how they got to this trick, but she would throw the car keys in front of his foot, <laughs> and uh, and uh, he would then get out of his freezing. So we tried this here. He had to place them just right, and then he started walking again. So, um, now, cues, uh, based on this inspiration, uh, a number of cues have been tried, like metronome, uh, marching music, there are special glasses that can project black and white tiles on the floor, so that you have an obstacle, a visual obstacle to step onto. And these often help, and are usually help for temporarily. Uh, the benefit is often partial and usually not sustained. This is queuing that's there all the time. And so one of the directions for the future um, is uh, to consider event-based queuing. So um, detect individual freezing episodes as they occur and then apply the queue at the beginning of the episode to abort the freezing episode. Um, now in, there's a parenthesis here because this would be a dream but actually, we would love to get to the point of predicting, uh, predicting the freezing episode shortly before it begins, and then find a cue that can prevent the freezing episode from actually occurring. Uh, but that's science fiction. Uh, this is a little closer uh, to reality. It's something that we can work on, okay? And as it happens, um, uh, we're in the age of wearable devices and miniaturization. Um, and so a number of collaborations have started, including uh, where I previously was uh, in New York and now here at, uh, uh, at Columbia, uh, sorry, at Washington University, uh, Gabon Earhart um, has joined forces with um, an engineering group in the School of Engineering. And so engineer, uh, engineers and clinicians um, are collaborating to try to create devices that help us monitor physical gate uh, so we can then develop some interventions. So one example is uh, from previous work, pressure sensors, and this is a shoe that was devised by, oops, sorry, an engineer, Sunil Agrawal um, and Damiano Zanotto, uh, who are engineers at Columbia University. And uh, uh, the other approach, uh, another approach is motion sensors, and uh, the professor of engineering is Arin Horai, and the graduate student in his group, Pratik Gundanavar, is, uh, is working with the Gammon's group um, to use a device to study the freezing of gait. And the drawing here shows a motion detector attached to a shoe. So the approach is, you know, how do we detect freezing episodes? The approach is to analyze data from the feet uh, during walking. The data could be uh, pressure data or motion data. And you see here a cycle of pressures from the uh, left foot and right foot. Uh, uh, this is normal walking. You can see a cycle, the right foot and the left foot uh, stepping in alternation. And then something different happens here, and it's clearly different. So the pressure sensors give us a change, and at the same time we have a video camera uh, so that a clinician can review the video and mark this as an episode of freezing. And so we tell the engineer, look, this is when freezing happened. Can you figure out how to detect uh, this change in the signal? And, uh, and then you have a little computer, a wearable computer, that can calculate the evidence for or against freezing um, as the patient walks. So here is a, a time going by, and then the computer calculates an increase in chance of freezing like this. I hope you're seeing the arrow and then I'm moving because otherwise it's pointless. Can you see the arrow? You can't see the arrow here? Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. 
Okay, uh, in the bottom trace, um, you, you see that red trace that goes up. That's a calculated chance that the patient is now freezing. Okay, and then the square bar, the rectangular bar, is the clinician's assessment that says this is when freezing is happening. So all I'm showing you is that the computer is getting the right answer. Okay, right now this is calculated after the fact, but uh, part of the effort is to find methods that work fast enough that we can do it in real time. So one dream for the near future, not too far hopefully, is that you can have a sensor in your shoe that detects freezing as it happens. And that's a necessary first step. If we want to apply interventions when freezing happens, we need something that can, can detect freezing uh, in real time. Uh, then there are, you know, I'm showing you the different approaches. Some of you may know that uh, um, machines or computers can detect pretty much anything these days. I mean, the power of detection has exploded. Um, we're finding actually that the, and, and I would call those blind models. You can throw in the computer the stock market data and the freezing data and uh, how often you take a shower and they'll decide all kinds of things about you. Um, but, um, which is fine, uh, that we call, you know, that one name for that is machine learning is being applied by a number of groups to, to process signals from sensors and decide when freezing is happening. Turns out actually that clinical insight can help here because freezing is a very special discrete event with specific features. And so some of us are injecting observations from the clinic um, to figure out how to take shortcuts and detect uh, and not need a lot of computing power to detect freezing on gate. So uh, some of you have seen me try out different things in the hallway for your freezing and uh, some of it is to get ideas uh, about um, what we can try in the lab. So it doesn't directly benefit you in that visit, but hopefully you're giving us ideas that can benefit everybody with freezing in the future. Um, okay, so let's say that we can detect freezing in real time. What can we do? So um, I uh, show you the patient who had figured out the trick with the keys and 10 years later, I found myself collaborating with, beginning collaboration with engineers, thinking, okay, once we detect, at some point we're gonna do, we want to do something. And we, you know, there's evidence that Google Glasses, projected images, metronomes don't always work. So I figured, why don't we start with something that does work? And uh, I had another patient uh, that we studied in the lab who had prolonged freezing. And with prolonged freezing, I had a chance to try the key trick myself. So here I throw a key in front of her foot and her freezing stops. Now her freezing was severe so it started again but every time I threw something and what you saw is I threw a key and then I figured okay what if it's a pen and so I threw a pen in front of her foot and both worked. Very encouraging, right? Because if a pen works and a key works why not a laser light? Why not um, a, a checkerboard pattern? The kinds of things that we heard in studies work uh, for a number of patients with freezing. So here she freezes again reliably on this curve. And here I am shining a laser light over and over, blinking right in front of her foot, same place as the key was, and it doesn't work. And this is, uh, I'm still shining, I mean, this is several seconds, freezing is winning. And then I put the key there and there she goes. <laughs> okay, so it's, I mean, it's remarkable. It's a lesson that uh, treatment will be, uh, that what we try for treatment will require quite an open mind in terms of uh, some creativity of what to use and who to use it for, because different patients may respond to different cues. I, I was also curious how much it mattered where the key was. And so here I am, I, I, I'm putting the key further than usual, tapping it, making it very obvious. It wasn't working, but the moment I put it closer, then the foot starts moving. Uh, so now, 
if you talk to, I mean, we clinicians talk about freezing and how baffling it is, and so we share stories on the kinds of tricks that people use. Uh, a colleague of mine had a patient who would not freeze as long as he carried two stuffed cows in his hands. Uh, they were his daughter's toys. Somehow he figured out, maybe he was moving them around the, her room, but figured out that when you carry these two objects, you didn't freeze, and that's how he walked. Um, so, one more video showing that the cues can be patient specific. So, another patient told me that if he had a bucket to kick, then he would stop freezing. And so his wife actually carried a little bucket that he would put in front of his foot, and then he would kick it and start walking again. So I tried it in this patient. Uh, I asked her to kick the cone, and uh, it didn't help her. So the, the cues may be very patient specific. So the conclusion is to find your own tricks. I think right now I have nothing to give you from research that is evidence based or that is very helpful. I think one direction hopefully will be developing devices that can intervene. But right now there are tricks and you haven't, if you haven't heard about them, uh, it, I encourage you to look for them. And uh, one place actually where you could, might find some is the Freezing, boot, the freezing on Gate Bootcamp organized by Trisha and uh, uh, Trisha Creel and Beth Templin, I think, run the Freezing Gate Booth Camp. Uh, uh, Beth, you heard speak, she's a physical therapist uh, working on uh, with Rocksteady Boxing. Uh, Trisha organized this whole uh, session today. Uh, she's the wellness program coordinator for the Greater St. Louis chapter of the APDA. So, uh, the Freezing Gate, or Gate Boot Camp is uh, happened once and will happen again. And they get every, many people together with Freezing Gate uh, to try out different physical maneuvers and interventions. And what I love about it, what I heard, is based on the experience you saw that I had um, of how idiosyncratic, how specific the maneuvers can be, what I love is that you're getting everybody together and sharing stories and approaches. And so that's one thing that I think you can do. Uh, this is the brochure. I'm sure that you can get it from the uh, APDA website for the Freezing Gate Book Camp. There's one coming up that's full, but I wouldn't be surprised if it happens again in the future. And then um, for resources in general, um, I just made a comment that I, I feel that as a neurologist, I might affect between 0 and 20% of your experience with Parkinson. And the rest is your loved ones in the community. And uh, because, because there are a lot of things in Parkinson that we don't address in the clinical office at all. Um, so the APDA is a website with all kinds of resources. And one of them is more general than just a freezing boot camp is the classes you heard about already. Uh, the, the live classes and streaming classes. This is a website. Um, and, and so I encourage you to take advantage of, of these, not only because for evidence-based proven interventions like exercise, but also for unusual things where you might find inspiration, like freezing your gate. Thank you.